time for the most insane gaming PC build I've ever put together. Featuring the new Ryzen 9 5950X, a Gigabyte RTX 3090, and even some water-cooled RAM. This build is gonna be insane. I'm gonna take you through the whole build process before booting this machine up and testing it in a load of titles to see just what $4,000 gets you in 2020. Make sure to get subscribed if you aren't already though, but let's dive into it. As always, I'm gonna kick things off by installing the CPU, the RAM, and the M.2 drive into this, our motherboard choice for today. This is the X570 masterboard, which basically means any feature you can think of, it's probably got. Three M.2 slots, a built-in rear I.O. shield, two and a half gigabit ethernet, and a load of shielding to keep the back of the board safe. It is a worthy match for our CPU choice today. Speaking of which, this is the Ryzen 9 5950 X. With an insane 16 cores and 32 threads and a stock boost clock speed knocking on the door of 5 gigahertz, this CPU is crazy. A massive shout out to eBuyer by the way who sent this out, lent it me for a couple of weeks. Uh, I'll leave all their links in the description below. Installing the CPU is pretty easy but then again you probably already know that if you go in for a Ryzen 9 CPU. It's a similarly positive story when it comes to our RAM choice today that I can't get out of the box. This is from Thermaltake and it's the first part of a really cool CPU cooler kit we're going to look at later. This really sleek design doesn't have any RGB on it. It's a travesty. <laughs> no, I'm joking. What we're actually gonna do is screw a water block on top of these later to keep them really, really cool, which is not all that necessary for RAM, but <laughs> I mean, I'm not gonna say no to it. We're gonna install these dims in the second and fourth dim slots. It's a simple case of lining up the notch in the center of the RAM, that's this one here, with the corresponding notch on your motherboard. And just like that, the RAM is into place. I'm gonna spin the board around and remove the first M.2 heatsink cover next, and that's gonna allow us to install the Seagate Firecuda 520. With read and write speeds of five giga bytes per second. I mean, that is unreal. This M.2 PCIe Gen 4 drive, the latest cutting edge technology, is gonna be perfect for this build. In order to do this, we're gonna need to grab our teeny tiny screwdriver. Once again, it makes a return. And then just remove this retention screw just there. There we go. And then we can simply go ahead and slide the drive into place. I'm actually surprised that out of the box, this doesn't require a heatsink like some of the Corsair options on the market. But Seagate informed me they actually modified and customized the controller on this drive to ensure that it doesn't run too hot. Before we get too carried away today then, I'm going to try and install some of our CPU cooler now before we go ahead and pop it into the case today. This is a very special cooler that I mentioned just a moment ago called the Flow RC360. I wanted to do something truly unique for the video today and this cooler which calls the RAM and the CPU with a 360 mil radiator. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that as far as unique goes. Let's grab our fans out of the box. First of all, there's one, there's two, and there's three, as well as these nicely organized bags of mounting hardware. You can see here, this is where the CPU is gonna get cooled, and this is just gonna bolt onto the top of our RAM dims with copper contact as well on the top of those dims, which should really help with temperatures and, of course, aesthetics. First things first, we actually just need to remove the pre-installed mounting hardware, and that includes both these two plastic brackets and the small metal backplate, which we're going to swap out with this backplate here. We do need to just pop some screws through it though, and you can see here that we can then slide this plastic stopper through, which will just hold it temporarily into place. Repeat for all four corners of your backplate, and then we're good to go. These black plastic stoppers are then just gonna sit nicely on top, which will hold our back plate really well into place. So then, we're gonna come back and finish the CPU cooler off later, but that should have made things just a little bit easier. I'm next gonna grab our case today, which is ugh, the absolutely giant Thermal Take View 51. Look at the size of that polystyrene. I can, can nearly fit my head through. I've used this case once before, but not for a build 
of quite this magnitude. In every case, you're gonna find a box of included accessories. This is basically gonna give us all the screws and stuff we need to install the motherboard today. Talking of which, uh, we're gonna slide our motherboard into place. The IO shield is already installed, so that makes our life just a little bit easier. The only other thing you do need to do is check that under each of the nine holes on the motherboard, that you've got a corresponding standoff in your case, just so that nothing grounds out or anything like that. We're gonna slide the motherboard with a bit of hand yoga get nicely into place. We're just going to go ahead and use these included screws to secure the motherboard nicely into place. Now that the motherboard's in, it's time to go ahead and install the cooler. I'm just going to move the case a bit closer to me and you can kind of see what the plan is here. We're going to have CPU, RAM and the CPU cooler itself with some fans on the front which are going to look pretty good as well. I think it makes sense to do the radiator first off and then we can deal with these bits just afterwards. Now the radiator's in, I'm also just going to pop in the three included 120 mil RGB fans as well, which are going to look really awesome when they're installed. And they screw in just like so. Now that the radiator's in, we're just going to whack a little bit of thermal paste onto the CPU chip itself. And we also just need to remove the pre-installed kind of water block mount and just replace it with that one just like so. That's then just going to slide over the pre-installed backplate assembly and fasten down with these suspension silver screws just like so. Okay then, with that all nicely done and dusted, the last thing to install really before we go ahead and pop the graphics card in is this, the power supply today. It's Thermaltake's Tough Power PF. One, it's got an addressable RGB fan and front kind of face, uh, and it's the recommended wattage for a 3090 build, just like this one. This is actually so new that it's still in its plastic packaging. Oh, and did I mention it's also 80 plus platinum, which is basically as good as it gets for a power supply. Here it is, it's pretty nicely packaged up with this cool little thermal take sleeve, and there is the modular interface of the power supply itself. Also also in this box you're going to find this bag which contains all of the cables and stuff that we're going to need today. This includes a SATA power cable, not one but two of these 8 pin CPU power connectors because our CPU is a thirsty boy. There's the second one as well as not one but two 6 plus 2 pin GPU power connectors and finally the largest of the bunch a 24 pin motherboard power cable. Boom. In this case, the power supply just slides into the rear of the chassis with the fan facing outwards just like so. And secure it into place here, 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 and here. Now, while we're here, it also makes sense to plug up some of the cables while everything's easy to access before our graphics card goes nicely in the middle. The first are our two CPU power connectors, which go to the top left of the motherboard, followed closely by the 24 pin motherboard power cable, which goes to the right hand side. HD audio is next up, it goes to the bottom left of the motherboard and has a pin blocked out, so it'll only go in one way. USB 3.0 or 3.1 Type A is next up. This is the long cable of the lot and is notched so we'll only go in one way around. Finally then we've got the front panel connectors. This is for our power reset and hard drive indicator LEDs. Uh, these cables can be the fiddliest of the bunch so take your time, don't rush it and don't panic if you get them the wrong way around. I'll pop a diagram on your screen now to make this as easy as possible and that really is all there is to it. I might pop some power supply extension cables on a little bit later on as well to spruce the whole thing up and make it look nice and tidy. For for now though, it's graphics card time. Specifically this, the Gigabyte RTX 3090. This card is absolutely feature packed and has a price tag to match. It looks fantastic though, as you'll see in just a second's time, and is actually the most powerful gaming GPU on the market right now. Yes, the 6900 XT is on the horizon, but even still, this is gonna be an insane card. And I will of course compare the two once I've got them in house. This case has got a vertical GPU mount, which should help to make it feel a little bit less empty. So we just need to remove those PCIe screws. All right then, and that's pretty much it. All I really need to do now is just install the PCIe riser cable to make sure the GPU's got plenty of support, plug up some power cables. I think the best course of action then is to boot this machine up and see how it performs in a load of the most popular AAA titles. First though, let's see just how good it looks in an epic glam sequence because it would be rude not to roll the montage
Okay then, now you've seen just how good this system looks when it's all powered up, and of course the process of putting it together step by step, let's see exactly how that 59, 50x and 3090 combo really performs. Death Stranding is first up with 4K high settings and DLSS set to performance mode. Here you see an 141 FPS on average with 123 and 114 for those 90 and 99th percentile results. DLSS given us a really nice performance upside here. GTA 5 is a game I always test out, not too difficult to run, but at 1440p high settings, you look at 122 FPS on average with 110 and 92 respectively. 4K is of course more than possible too, here you're going to see around the 85 FPS mark with everything max out and GTA 5 is a very demanding game on this front. Control is another one of the DLSS titles today and also of course supports ray tracing. 4K medium to high settings with RTX enabled gives us 77 frames per second on average with 70 and 67 for those 90 and 99th percentile results. You could easily get above 100 frames per second with RTX disabled but I think the game looks great with it on. Talking of which, Apex Legends is next up 4K high settings sees 160 FPS on average and season 7 of the game looks fantastic. You're also going to see around about 144 and 128 FPS for those 90 and 99th percentile results. Call of Duty's Warzone performed really well at 4K high settings, 124 FPS on average with 107 and 95 for those 90 and 99th percentile results. And yes, I will test the new COD out very, very soon once my video schedule nicely catches up. Forza Horizon 4 is a personal favourite of mine, 4K ultra settings in the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode and you look at 138 FPS on average, 122 and 113 for the 90 and 99th percentile results won't leave you disappointed either. Talking of not disappointing, Overwatch, 4K ultra settings looks 259 FPS. That's kind of crazy, 235 and 222 for the 90 and 99th percentile results and Overwatch is a superb gaming experience at 4K Ultra settings. 4K at CSGO, or 4K in CSGO I should say, is also a great experience. A really easy to run game but you guys always ask for it and at 404 FPS you're not going to be disappointed. Battlefield 5 is next up 1440p with RTX on, 4K with RTX enabled a bit too demanding to have a really really nice gaming experience. Here though 128 frames per second on average is a great result, 114 and 108 for those 90 and 99th percentile results and if you disabled RTX you could definitely game at over 100 FPS at 4K as well. Doom Eternal at 4K Ultra Nightmare settings what a name for a settings preset, sees 146 FPS on average with 113 and 100 for those 90 and 99th percentile results. A really great test of rasterization as well and the game looks pretty phenomenal. Rainbow Six Siege is next, 121 FPS at 4K in the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode is not going to disappoint, with 108 and 102 for the 90 and 99th percentile results, given a really consistent, even, high frame rate gaming experience. It's happy days in Rainbow Six Siege. Talking of which, Valorant. Valorant at 4K uh, sees 318 frames per second on average, with the FPS is pretty much maxed out across the board. 277 and 203 for the 90 and 99th percentile results ain't half bad either. Finally then, the last game on my list today is Fortnite. Here you look in 4K with RTX uh, enabled first off and DLSS set up performance mode, just shy of 60 FPS on average. If you wanted to go slightly higher with the frame rate, head up to 4K, disable RTX and leave DLSS enabled and you're going to be looking 241 FPS on average with 199 and 160 for those 90 and 99th percentile results. I personally think the ray tracing in Fortnite looks fantastic, but at 4K it's very intensive and as such if you want that super high frame rate, super high res gaming experience, go for the 4K with RTX off and if you want ray tracing on, go for 1440p and that's going to provide a really playable experience too. 
I also tested out the 3D Mark Fire Strike Extreme Benchmark, which of course put this system in pretty much the top 1% of all PC configurations globally, which is kind of insane. With that being said though, that pretty much wraps it up for the benchmarks today and the whole video. If you did enjoy it, make sure to give it a big old like rating, get subscribed if you aren't already. Thank you very much for watching though, and as always, we'll see you in the next one.